Hello and welcome to this uh, webcast uh, from the Belt and Road Institute in Sweden. Uh, my name is Hussein Askari. I'm a board member of the Belt and Road Institute in Sweden. I will be hosting, which is a, a new feature of our activity, which is uh, hosting webcasts uh, on a weekly or sometimes uh, twice uh, a month uh, on subjects pertaining to what we discussed, the Belt and Road Initiative its uh, importance, its impact, and we will deal with themes which are either geographically uh, uh, related, like we discuss uh, Sweden or Scandinavia's relationship to the Belt and Road or Africa or Asia, or we will have other themes related, for example, to financing, uh, to technology, to other issues and obstacles and advantages of the Belt and Road from a technical standpoint. As uh, we define in our website, uh, the Belt and Road Institute in Sweden is a non-political, non-religious, non-profit uh, association. So uh, we don't deal so much with the uh, political and geopolitical aspects uh, which are predominant in the discussion of the Belt and Road Initiative, overshadowing any objective uh, discussion of the economics of the Belt and Road uh, Initiative, which we have decided that this is our uh, foremost interest and to inform people in Sweden, in Europe and around the world about the economic aspects of the Belt and Road, the, the devoid of all the kinds of uh, information and disinformation about this uh, initiative. Today, which is the first of our series, we will be discussing the what the last year ended with on a positive note, which is the uh, reaching the EU-China agreement. Uh, it's called the Comprehensive Agreement on Investment, the CAI. And uh, for to discuss that, I have with me a person who is very, very familiar with the questions of investments in China, in EU, and out and around the world. Uh, Mr. Hen Henry Tillman is the head of the China Investment Research. I welcome you to our webcast. Thank you, thank you very much. Yes, delighted thank to you. be here. Yeah, we have, uh, you are the man to go to when it comes to numbers and uh, uh, statistics on the investment inbound and outbound from China and for, to China. So we will have a whole deal of, uh, of things to discuss. I uh, just want to start with the 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 news which came out uh, on the 30th of uh, uh, of December, which is almost the last day of the um, uh, the last day of the uh, of the year 2020, which was a dramatic year. It ended on a positive note when the leaders of the China and the EU, Mrs. Angela Merkel, uh, the chairman of the EU Commission, president, uh, the chair uh, and the you know, chairman of the uh, EU Commission and the president of the EU uh, had a video conference with President Xi Jinping to announce and uh, finalize, uh, or at least uh, the agreement which they reached on the comprehensive uh, investment agreement. Now, the uh, the what is being uh, reported in the uh, in the uh, EU Commission's website, uh, it was. There was a press release on the 30th of December uh, by the, um, uh, at the, EU, the website of the EU Commission, uh, which praised this agreement as a, as a very an important breakthrough, which has taken many years in the making. Uh, and that, of course, the statement is a more of a political statement than an economic one, but it, uh, it is on a positive no uh, note. It says, states that the comprehensive agreement on investment uh, will be the most ambitious agreement that China has ever concluded with a third country. It also says that the, the CAI will ensure that EU investors achieve better access to a fast growing 1.4 billion consumer market and that they compete on a better level playing field in China. So uh, many of the points which are uh, given in this um, uh, press release uh, is uh, related to what the EU uh, negotiator has achieved. Great victories for the EU, which is important to be able to 
uh, bring this to, to people in Europe, that uh, the EU have achieved a number of things which we're going to discuss with Henry today. Uh, with the main most important point they ref refer, refer to is the removing the joint venture rest restrictions. Uh, then we have the rules on forced transfer of technology, which is uh, one of the big negatives uh, that they uh, say that China forces European companies working in China to transfer their technology, like intellectual theft, so to speak. And then there is uh, the EU says it's achieved the creation of a level playing field. And that is related to the state owned enterprises of China who are, they say, heavily subsidized by the government and that makes it they makes those SOEs more competitive than European competitors. Uh, and then we have the question of the access to Chinese financial markets, which is something which most uh, European and even American uh, financial and banking interests were very interested in uh, getting China to agree to. And then, of course, we will end up with a discussion on the uh, how this uh, agreement will affect uh, the, the Belt and Road Initiative, which is our main subject. Uh, but uh, we have uh, also the question of the how the, the China EU kind of agreements can affect their joint uh, ventures or cooperation in third countries. Like if there are investments in Africa, in Asia, in South America, and even in Europe, how does the relationship is defined between Chinese and European companies? So uh, these are the issues we want to discuss uh, with Henry. But uh, we start first with the fact that this took seven years from before the Belt and Road Initiative uh, was initiated until 2020 when the signing took place. So what has transpired in that period? Uh, again, thank you for having me. Um, you're, you're correct, it's uh, seven years. And I think someone said it took 35 rounds of negotiations over that period of time. But I think some highlights in that period of time will show how this was moving in that direction for some time, but it took that final push at the end from both the EU and from President Xi himself to get this to actually to be signed. So you'll, you'll realize that when everyone thinks of Chinese outbound investment, they're all going to go to the 16, 17 period with all these Chinese buying these big assets, um, Chem China, Sinochem, all those big deals and you saw in Europe. Um, and that was the period of time when all those things happened since then. Much, so much has changed. And what you saw change in part was um, policy changes within China, as well as policy changes from other parties from around the world. So China has gone from fake positions to taking large stakes and large acquisitions. And beginning in 2018, they started looking at investments which are much smaller and much focused on growth capital, much long along the lines of a Tencent and Alibaba were minority stakes in these companies rather than buying large controlling stakes. So a more moderate uh, minority stake position, number one. Number two is, is if you remember the, the, the trade the trade war that started in 1718. And China began looking at opening up their investments into their country around 1718. There were two um, draft laws, the, the financial, the opening, uh, and one was Mofcom, one was in, in NDRC and President Xi intervened in that. So he chose one of those, those contracts to then move into law, which was then um, agreed in 19 and opened into 20. And so, uh, and this was this was all really sort of agreed in eighteen. And at, at, at part, as part of that, you've already seen a bit of opening up of of China from European investment. In particular, uh, in eighteen, it was agreed that some of these joint ventures, particularly in the automotive, uh, you would see control change by twenty twenty two. So it was already moving in that direction beginning in eighteen. Um, so he because, uh, I, we can uh, actually uh, there we have a couple of examples uh, because and also that what uh, used to scare people of the, the of China and China's investments that China was taking huge chunks of European industries because we here in stock in Sweden we have the the uh, example of Volvo uh, which was in deep trouble like other. Uh, automakers after the financial crisis in uh, 2008 and 2009, 
we had Saab, uh, the other automaker was um, getting into deep trouble. It would uh, eventually went bankrupt, but Volvo, which was owned by Ford, China, Geely, in the Chinese company took over the whole Volvo cars. Uh, and, but that was a good uh, business for Volvo actually, because its sales grown in the Chinese markets and it survived the crisis. And now it's one of the big uh, players. But uh, later, uh, that was in 10, 2010, but in 2017, Geely, for example, took uh, only 8% of the, of the shares of the Volvo trucks and only 9.7% of the Daimler uh, stocks, uh, which controls, of course, Mercedes-Benz. So is that the kind of shift which took place from taking 50% or 100% to taking uh, less, which is less than 10%? Uh, Actually, good, it's a good question. The, the answer is yes. Um, the, it's, it's moved really from about 17, 18 to where uh, many of these transactions, which then segues nicely into transfer of technology, you, you'll find many of these transactions where China doesn't want to own the technology. They simply want to utilize it in China. So they might buy a 9% stake in a company and then use that stake or 10, 8% and use that, that technology in China. For example, last year in France, uh, robotic surgery. This robotic surgery company had to, raise, had to raise 40 million of growth capital. China raised about 16 of that. And so the two owners of that company, the two uh, growth capital players in that company were both Chinese investors, one including the Silk Road Fund. But they don't wanna own the company. They wanna be able to take that technology and use it in this high growth hospital, highly consolidating. Uh, industry, hospital industry in China. So it's much more, they don't want to own it. They want to be able to take that technology and just have a stake in it to be able to then uh, use it and help the company, the French company grow or help us health tech yes. last year in Sweden, health tech in Sweden last year, less than 10%, yeah. also using it in China. So again, it's taking these companies, embedding them in, into, into China with a much larger, larger market. Right. Well, that brings us to the other question, which uh, people consider as a big problem in dealing with China, which is the, the you know, uh, forced transfer of technology. When, like, that happens mostly with, when you have mergers and acquisitions of whole companies. But how does that re is reflected in the new rules? And when did this 10% rule get into, um, but it's, got into the, the system, so to speak. But how, how does the question of forced transfer of technology is resolved now in this agreement? Well, it's basically that what was relied before was some soft protections under WTO language. And that was inadequate for the, for the EU. So they put much more active management of what goes in, into that. And it's not just, it's not just for m &A, it's also for joint ventures. It's also for partnerships. So it's an overriding protection. The EU is going to examine each of these, protect that technology. So you could use the technology. You could actually pay a fee for licensing rights of that technology, but you can't actually take the technology. Now, again, a lot of this was based upon things that China did 2010, 2013, 2015. It's moved on from there. Yes, the Americans were always screaming that we, they're still in that technology. And now, as we know, China is way ahead of America in many parts of innovation and technology. So again, but it's a specific protection put in by the EU to, as an override. And again, it's not just a, a controlling stakes, it's also in JVs or even in partnerships, operating partnerships. Yeah, that, that, that shows that the Chinese are actually very adaptive. Uh, they are very flexible. Uh, that they when the, 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 uh, the counterpart comes with conditions or new terms, they try to figure out if this is good for the cooperation, we will adapt to it. But they adapt not I, by just accepting a loss, they adapt to it by making this venture successful. I mean, I remember once uh, watching the uh, former finance minister of Greece, uh, uh, Varoufakis, uh, giving a lecture, he said when he, you know, you remember when the, the Greek uh, 
when Greece be, uh, had the enormous financial crisis and the, the trilateral commission or the, uh, uh, the EU tried to force certain changes in the, in the government policy in Greece and actually forced it to sell major assets, state-owned assets in the market. Now, one of the, these were the Piraeus uh, port, uh, which no Europeans were, were interested in buying. So Costco, the Chinese, they bought it uh, very cheap and then they started uh, working there and developing it. But when the new socialist government came in uh, with this Varoufakis, as well, he said he, he summoned the heads of the Costco and said, look, you got this deal very cheap. Now we have to change some of these things. Like for example, the stakes you have taken are too high for a very little payment. So you have to reduce that. And they say, well, from 60 something to 50%. He said, no problem, what else? And he said, well, we need to have, we have to use the, the difference in that amount for investments it's also in the pension funds for the Greek workers in the port. And he said, no, they said, no problem. And then he said, we want you to do investments in industrial projects around the port. And he said, no problem. So they just kept, <laughs> if it was conductive to doing the thing, they kept saying, yes, yes, yes. And both sides got a fair share. Now, the, then they, they increased their investments in, the, in Perayos. And now it's one of the largest and maybe the largest container port in the whole uh, Mediterranean. So it seems that the Chinese adapt to uh, counterparts uh, conditions, but they adapt in a way that both sides can win not one side wins and one side loses. Well, as we know, uh, President Xi loves the win-win the concept. But I would say it's something bigger than that. I'd say, I agree, first of all, I agree with you. But I think it's timetables are different. Timelines are very different. Piraeus is a, is a very strategic port for a long period of time in the Belt and Road. As you know, you're, you're a student of the Belt and Road. You will under, you'll know this. And so China is going to look at things in a much longer period of time. If, you know, people say, how do you do these big uh, G2G projects where there's no cash flow the next 10 years? Well, that's okay, because at the end of the day, the Belt and Road is finished in 2049. So we're still quite a ways before we get to 2049. So they, and they look at it, say, number one. Number two is there's been a huge change inside of China as China has morphed into its uh, um, building a consumer business. Right, a consumer, because that has to drive that has to drive China, and the, as a part of that, the excess cash China has had to invest externally has really been has been has to be rerouted internally, and so that China is dependent upon opening up its FDI, and so you've seen a huge change from China. It was flat for five years until around 2018. Then each year since 2018, the FDI inbound has increased into China. It will continue to increase number one, and pure FDI. Yes, and so they need that cash to continue to drive China, and as doing that, it increases the, the consumer business in China. In addition, it, can, it increases the Western part of China. So you've seen the dual circulation this year, which is along the West of China, right? You've seen, you've seen the links two years ago with Singapore and Chongqing. You've seen Chongqing Chengdu this, this year. You've seen Brunei in the West even five years ago. So China has to develop the west part of China, yes, which requires inbound capital. So they must show flexibility. There is a, brings us to the next question, actually, which is, it's not on one of the points I took, but I think it's uh, worth uh, pointing at, is that now there's a narrative which says that China is withdrawing from the Belt and Road Initiative. It's uh, focusing inwards. Uh, its investments have shrunk. Uh, all, in all Belt and Road uh, countries and, and so on and so forth. I mean, you say that China has gradually decreased its foreign direct investment in Europe, for example, but that does not really affect the overall situation. But you say also that China also, as you mentioned now, need, needs to develop certain sections of its internal economy. Now that people say that this is a creating a new consumer economy. But I don't think that's really the, the case because while the, uh, during the COVID-19 crisis we had, the governments in the EU and the United States were trying to uh, 
uh, repair the damage caused to the consumer markets uh, by propping up the, the, the markets, but also uh, giving incentives for more consumption. But the Chinese, I guess, what they did with their incentives, they also had packages of incentives, is to focus on developing the infrastructure in China itself, but also supporting the small and medium-sized corporations in, inside China. So it's not to prop up a consumer market, which is the typical thing one would think that in times of crisis, you either have austerity or you have the Keynesian solution is that you throw money at people so they can consume more so you can get the economy going. Is this something you, you sense is going on in China that it's different than what we have here in the West? I think the word you use is spot on called focus. What is it called? So, it's, it's called focus. Focus. <laughs> they're, very, they're quite focused. So in essence, you're right. As all the, the amounts go down externally, you actually see, I just finished a, an M&A forum you know, earlier this afternoon. It, so what you find is the overall amounts shrunk considerably. Yes, 85%, 85% since 2016. But yet healthcare, technology, renewable energy, these are all focus areas for China, both outbound as well as to use that small stakes, the growth capital to grow their own businesses inbound. So it's much more focused and I think, and it's, grow, it's, it's focused on growth technology to grow longer term. That's, that's a very important that they are, they're, they, fo they are focusing because this is the whole Chinese policy is shifting from qua quantitative uh, development in, you know, to qualitative. That's what the Chinese leaders said. We have to go into a quality uh, innovation driven economy. But that also can reflect into the kind of investments, as you are saying, the fields they're investing in. For example, in the EU uh, press release, it uh, claims a big victory that the Chinese will allow more uh, uh, electric car uh, pro uh, pro uh, producers into the Chinese market. And we both know that the, in reality, yes, China welcomes uh, for, but the question of the, this technology and the question of the batteries, as we both of us have looked at some um, numbers that it is China, which is the dominant force internationally in the production of lithium batteries and other uh, batteries which are used in these vehicles. China controls maybe uh, a, a large part of the international production of that. So it doesn't really hurt China to open up for uh, European produced uh, electric vehicles and other kinds of uh, new technologies but at the end china will be the one producing most of these for the eu or the united states or other countries is that something you have looked at sure i mean i'm an advisor also and i spent most of the last year working on a large lithium transaction from chile into china particularly for this matter and or korea into china but i think what we're saying here is that china is going to be it's decided it's going to be a home for this production Yes, and therefore we'll attract the investment from Korea, from Germany, from from France, from European, from foreign uh, international players in technology. Uh, sorry, in automotive and also components, which is lithium or or uh, you saw, I think it was uh, a DRC in December with a with a transaction with uh, Molly Bendham, which yes, for cobalt which we'll go into it as well. So I think it signs itself as a hub, attracting this foreign capital from around the world on, on that particular matter, yes. But it, remember also that half of the, it shows that it starts, the analysis talks about 140 billion each direction in the last 20 years. Remember roughly half of that from Europe into China has been automotive. So they know each other, they've worked with each other the last 20 years. So you're building on a strength, which is why I started with the automotive piece with the, the joint venture piece here first. Because again, half of that goes back a long time. They know each other, they work with each other. And it's not just the, the actual automotive manufacturing, it's everything that goes with that, that industry. So then they know each other. It's long-term relationships. Yeah, so there are many of the points which the EU says now that these were achieved now, but these were things which the both sides were, have been working on uh, for a very long time.
uh, this is nothing new, for example, so somebody like you, you know that these things have been going on for a while. There is nothing new about it. Well, I think what the EU did well done to them actually is uh, the other half was manufacturing. And many of those were stuck with half, with the 50% joint venture restrictions. And, you know, we follow all of that. So in the last couple of years, there have been more and more activity, small M&A into China, around 100 million, 150 million. But the middle market M&A has not been there for, for Europeans to invest in China. And that's specifically permitted in this, in this, in the CAI. That's a real win for, it's a real win for, for China. Sorry, it's a real win for Europe. Yeah, that's good to know. There, when we go to the next point uh, on the idea of uh, this uh, complaint uh, uh, in Europe generally and in the United States that China is subsidizing, subsidizing these giant state-owned enterprises uh, who are the biggest in the construction in the world so they can take any contract anywhere in the world if there's a bidding they will take it but the EU says that they do that not because of they are capable of building cheap efficient and quick but because they are subsidized by the Chinese state and therefore they it makes them more competitive now the EU says now they will they have reached some agreement with China to that these companies <laughs> will behave themselves. I don't really know what that means, but uh, maybe you, you can explain that. Well, these are, these are my clients on a daily basis. So I could talk about how difficult it is for President Xi or the management of the country to deal with these, these elephants. Roughly 30% of the GDP from the, from the country comes from these large SOEs, which are getting bigger because they're consolidating versus smaller. And it's very difficult in the West if we need to shrink the workforce. It's not so easy in China to do that. It's not so easy in China to also provide economic enhancements. So about three years ago, China started on its own uh, form of hybrid privatizations. Not like we have here in the UK or like we have seen in Europe, but these are hybrids. And only three of these have been done to date. But in, that, in essence, they are selling either majority stakes in these companies or minority stakes, but the goal is to put more pressure on management of the SSOEs to become more economically um, um, accountable. Yes, so you know, some of the big investors are private equity firms. Now that's been a mixed bag so far. So they've had one big, big one that's less than less than 50%. It's been it's re been restructured. It's doubled the revenue, tripled the EBITDA. It's going to be an IPO. That's that's a tick. One of them is 50-50, so it's sort of in the middle. One's 15%, which is not so successful. So, you know, this it's it's while it's moving, it's moving, it's not moving fast enough. So, so China, so the EU wanted some assurances that uh, that China will look over the shoulder, basically of these things. And of course, I, I'm, I'm not sure all your uh, people will know this, but most of the chairman of these large um, uh, SOEs now have KPIs. And those KPIs are reviewed by state council. So it's what, not what, a good idea. What does the KPIs stand for? Key, key performance indicators. Mm -hmm. And to show you how this works, the chairman of China Rail failed his KPIs in July, and he went off a building in August of this year. So they take it pretty seriously in China if they don't do their job with the, hitting their financial performance returns. Yeah. I, I'm my personal experience with some uh, Chinese companies that they say, look, we are willing to work in uh, Iraq or so, but we are, there's a demand on us to be profitable. This is not charity. This is not political right. influence. We are told if this project is not profitable, you don't do it. So that's so there's all, a big misunderstanding because some people say China is peddling influence through financing all kinds of projects that are white elephants just to win influence. But in reality, these companies are required to be profitable at the same time as they promote the BRIs, infrastructure development, you know, state to state cooperation and so on and so forth. But these are, these are, there are commercial considerations. As you say, it has been increasing now. Uh, so th there's a bit of a misunderstanding there. These well, are not political vehicles. These are real businesses. Well, it's also evolved again, like we were talking about before, but time changes. In the last year, what I, some of the things I've been working on, the Chinese actually have to get internal 
value buy off of financial returns before they're even allowed to meet the other side. Which is, I, in the West, we never have that problem, ever. And I've done this for 30 years. So in the last three of these large SOEs, they've got an internal sign-off on what it looks like, valuation and returns, before they're actually allowed to even introduce themselves to the other party. So it's going the other direction. Well, then we just move forward to just because of the limitation of time is the question. One of the key points that the EU said is a big success is that China is opening access to its financial markets. And in, you know, the, the, there might be, I mean, China has been reluctant to opening to these markets, uh, its financial markets to what they see usually happens in developing nations, uh, emerging markets that you get hot money getting into the country, prop, propping up huge bubbles in the financial markets and real estate market and so on. And therefore they don't want that kind of development. They want invest, you know, that financial investment to come into what to their real economy, to their physical economy and contribute to that, not simply to make profit, you know, make money out of money as we are used to uh, here in the West. So uh, how is your view of this? Uh, is this gonna be a problem for China or is it gonna be under controlled forms? I'll, I'll give you the good numbers first and then we'll talk about the problem or the complexities. The good numbers are that China's current 10 year bond is currently yielding around 3.1% upsloping yield curve and think about that re uh, return versus other returns on a risk reward basis around the world right now. So you can see you've seen record inflows the Chinese bond market from international holders the last I think it's 18 to 20 months in a row. Not a surprise, yes? And there's still a long way to go because U.S. Treasuries, um, uh, I think currently only 9% of Chinese Treasuries are owned by international markets you can see a way to get to 20%. So there's a lot more in, in there's a lot more to go. But back to your point, the in the current nuances, right? Uh, if uh, the US deficit last year was three, three trillion, and under Trump they produced eight trillion, yes, of of uh, borrowings, and they're talking about another two, two two trillion right now. So I listened to the deputy governor of PBOC this morning on the very same point you're talking about, which is we're concerned about what happens in other markets because that money flows in and money flows out. We're therefore concerned for what's happening with US markets, with US, with US treasuries, because as more and more this keeps going, the, the more you know, we're, we're more highly rated and therefore we'll, we'll attract more and more money. So I'm not sure how they can handle that because from, from, they really can't control other governments, right? But it is, it is a real concern. And, but I do say that from the Chinese point of view, they've done an excellent job of carefully opening up those debt markets. And the equity markets, as you well know, in China, in particular in biotechnology or healthcare firms have been, or tech in general, and very strong in the last two years. I think three of the top five markets in the world are in greater China. Again, attracting, attracting European investors or global investors. Yeah, I think th there's a, you know, the question of profitability, because, you know, the Chinese are doing what uh, we used to have in the in the in the West before in the best periods that the idea of financial instruments or money is that you want to increase the productivity of the economy, you want to increase the living standards of the economy, not simply making profit because you can make profit by speculating on on uh, stocks or on derivatives or currencies, but that does not lead to any improvement in the living conditions or productivity of the labor force. The Chinese view is that you create money, and I have done, you know, made presentations and looked, written articles about how China behaved after the 2008 financial crisis, is that because China produced almost as much as the European Central Bank, the, Jap the US Federal Reserve, the Japanese Central Bank, and the Bank of England, they produced around $14 trillion, but we don't see any effect of these $14 trillion in quantitative easing in the West on the living conditions, on the productivity of the economy, because these went to save financial and banking institutions. Yeah. China produced almost as much, but these were channeled through their 
uh, policy banks and other private banks into real physical, like the, the high-speed railway revolution took place after 2008. Yes. Because 2008, ironically, in August 2008, just before the Olympics, when the markets were crashing in, in the West, China inaugurated the first uh, the Beijing, Tianjin high-speed rail line, which is, that's a very small thing. But in 10 years, they have built about 25,000, now it's 37,000 kilometers of high-speed rail. So the Chinese idea of issuing credit is it goes to productive initiatives. Not doesn't they don't save banks, they don't save financial speculators. And they also do this. So for now, the last couple of years, China has been very strong, as you know, in investing in 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 inward technology and healthcare. Yes, and what you've seen, they've, they've committed so much money into our semiconductors. Yes, they're going to build their own centerpiece for all of those. But I think also they've been they've done a great job of attracting foreign capital to those. So for example, if you look at the flows the last three years of inbound outbound in healthcare in China or biotech, much of that's come from the West. Much of that's come from the EU. So or or from Singapore or from uh, or from um, Japan or Korea. So you now have a biotech market in China which didn't exist 10 years ago. And now as we speak, uh, there were back Chinese vaccines going to 20 countries and that didn't exist 10 years ago. It's pretty extraordinary. And that has come from, from partnerships with the USA, which by the way, last year of all those partnerships of drug partnerships between China and the West, 50% was with the USA. They're small matters sometimes one or two million, but it's the point is they're working on drug developments together, drug discovery together, and the same is true in Europe. Yes, and everyone says, gee, they don't collaborate. Well, that's not true, they actually do. So, but again, the, the umph behind this, the amount of money produced by this, the four leading biotech companies in China last year for their shareholders produced 60 billion, sorry, sorry, 30 billion of uplift. The, the shareholders of the four, largest biotech companies in China last year had 30 billion shareholder uplift in one year. So that's how it's been built from China, but supported around the world. As you say, it's long-term building. And then by the way, because of that, they can then serve the world from, from vaccines. Yeah, that's really the, the essence of the relationship between nations is to do, the, you know, working together for the common good. It's, you know, all, for all the China bashing which took place in the United States last year and even here in Europe, China actually e export to the United States increased exactly. in the last year, in spite of all the, <laughs> what the politicians were saying, especially in medical uh, terms. I mean, there was a, a hearing in Congress with the, the, uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the United States, Mike, uh, uh, Mark Milley, in March, and they asked him, how much are we dependent on China for our medicines? And he said, I can talk about the military. I don't know if it's 97% or 98%, <laughs> but most, almost everything we get for our for American forces is the antibiotics, medicines, or materials that go into antibiotics and medicines and vaccines come from China. That's for the US military, 97, 98%. So, you know, that, that does, you know, that's where the politicians get it wrong. People who think in a political or geopolitical mindset, they don't really look at the reality, the physical reality, how nations live, how they work together, how they can help each other. Uh, and therefore, I mean, at our institute, we are very focused on these aspects. Uh, we don't want to respond to all these uh, things, but if we look at the numbers, if we look at the kind of economic cooperation, if we look at the fantastic cooperation between scientists and physicians last year in China, the US, Europe, I mean, they were intensive discussions on a weekly basis between Chinese uh, physicians and hospitals and American physicians and hospitals. And that German. also went- The first with, one, the first one was, was actually German, funded by China. You mean- uh, the, BioNTech. 
the, vi the vaccine. Yeah, the vaccine actually was funded by China and the U.S., but made in Germany. But that, that's a fascinating aspect that this is what we mean is uh, the Belt and Road Initiative. It's it can build bridges among nations. It can enhance cooperation among nations. It can remove a lot of the misunderstandings, the uh, the 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 prejudice uh, among nations, uh, because that kind of economic interaction, human interaction, and as you have pointed out earlier is that the Belt and Road Initiative is not just infrastructure, it's not just railways and containers. There are many layers of the Belt and Road, which is the, the uh, now we have the digital Silk Road, we have the health Silk Road, which emerged last year strongly. We have cultural Silk Road, we have the space Silk Road. We have all kinds of fields to work together on that are so immense, they're so big that China won't be able to do all this work alone. It will take the efforts of the most advanced countries, but also bringing that economic cooperation, technological cooperation to other nations. And well, that brings me to the last question in our discussion is that how can China and the EU and the United States, uh, if there is a positive policy, work together in third party countries, like if the we, they work together in, in uh, Africa. Now we had had seminars here where we had many ambassadors from Africa speaking at our seminar who say who invited China and the EU countries and Sweden to build the, to contribute to building the Belt and Road in Africa, building infrastructure in Africa uh, to improve the living conditions, but also the productivity of the African continent. So this kind of, investment agreement between the EU and China, how does that affect when Chinese and European companies would work, for example, in joint ventures in Africa? I know there are joint ventures pr pr uh, uh, proposed, for example, for the Inga Dam in the Congo, because we had a, a Spanish and a Chinese company getting together, but then that didn't really work out. There is a, another project, Italian and Chinese companies on the transfer of water for the Lake Chad, the Trans Aqua project. But how does that reflect the, the agreement we have now? How could that be reflected in working together in places like in Africa, Asia, and South America? It's still in the nascent stages. The first one of these that we tried was in the end of 18 between Japan and China in construction in Thailand. And even though they had supposedly, and in Europe, Supposedly, 50 different locations, only two or three have been tried. So still in these uh, stages. However, I'm currently working with um, Portuguese healthcare to get funding from China through Macau to distribute all through Portuguese speaking parts of the world, Africa, Latin America. So again, drugs being, um, healthcare being created, biotech being created in Portugal, being funded by Macau and distributed throughout Portuguese speaking countries in Africa. This is a live, a live assignment that I'm, I'm working with. Yes, yes. Um, the same is true with uh, France and, and, uh, and China in places like um, Morocco, Algeria. Yes, because they're working together in those places rather than, rather than uh, you know, um, but it's early days yet is the answer because people are still finding a place. But uh, I think the biggest upside last year, as I just mentioned with Portugal and healthcare, really comes, I think that the real uh, effect, first effect, seeing how this all works is the digital, is the Health Silk Road. Yes, because this is truly, by the end of last year, China offered um, assistance, medical assistance to 150 countries. That, that's pretty incredible. If you remember, China was still taking, the last European assistance into China was 23rd of February, and by the 20th of October, China had offered assistance to 150 countries around, around the world. Now, China had always been, you know, since 1963, provided some medical assistance or some hospitals in Africa or Afghanistan or, but this became global. And that's being rapidly followed by uh, um, trials, vaccine trials, and now vaccine rollout. Yes. So this is all happening so quickly in less, in less than one year. So I think the Chinese have always said, 
health is more important than wealth. And I think this is the, this is what really happened last year. And it happened in such a short period of time. But this yeah. is the first real leak of the of a global belt and road. I think the others you're talking about, I believe in those because I work every day in those. But I think it'll the penny is really going to drop as you see. I think China now has five <laughs> vaccines there or thereabouts to, the, to, the, to the share with all these different countries. Because I think it was uh, well, it was the last president, President Trump said you can only use U.S. vaccines for U.S. citizens. That doesn't really help many of the, much of the world. Yeah, that's uh, really something. I mean, uh, talking about the healthcare uh, uh, aspect of, uh, you know, the health Silk Road. I mean, last year we had a lot of activities in our Belt and Road Institute in Sweden, webinars and articles, but we also studies because I looked at the fact that if you want to give a global standard of healthcare, which is in the United States, they call the whole Burton standard, which right. means that you need like four uh, uh, hospital beds per thousand uh, uh, residents, uh, people in the country. So if you extend that standard, uh, which we do have like in Europe and uh, although it's de de deteriorating, but if we take that standard and extend it to Africa, what we need in Africa is that we need to build almost 15,000 major hospitals in Africa. Now, what we looked at is that how much electricity and clean water you need for each hospital. Yeah. So it's not just goodwill. Right. You need to look at how, when you build a hospital, not only the material which goes into building the hospital, which needs a lot of uh, to build, plants factories to produce the materials but also and also the roads that go to these hospitals and from these hospitals but also you need to produce the power electricity and the clean water for these hospitals so uh, in that sense this is an immense uh, project but it's a wonderful project to be able to get to bring the united states europe and china to build because we not only need to remedy the situation now, we want to look at the causes of the spread of pandemics and the issues with healthcare, especially in Africa, and resolve them in that sense. So by building a universal healthcare system for every nation in Africa, not only sending aid, although that's very important today, but in the future, what we need to work with China on is to join our hands and build the infrastructure which is necessary to give people in Africa and other parts of the world universal health care coverage. I think we covered a lot, Henry. Can I just finish that? Um, Can I finish that one point? Because I want to, you're, you're spot on. So just to make the, the last point, if I may, sorry, um, to show you that it's a small step, but not, not what you're talking about. By the end of the year last year, China had sorted out a way to take the German uh, vaccine by Pfizer uh, by uh, refrigerating, uh, right, from Shenzhen twice a week to uh, Addis Ababa, and then Addis Ababa would then uh, circulated through all of, of uh, um, Africa. Yes, and it's the only way to, it's, and by Ethiopian Air, yes, so regular flights out of Shenzhen to Ethiopia to circulate that, that, uh, that particular, um, and no other, and no other country has sorted out something like that. Now it's a small step, but yet it's getting it's getting that vaccine that does exist in the Ethiopia using Ethiopia as a hub to then sparse, parcel out to other parts of of, of, uh, of Africa. So it's nothing near what you're talking about, but it is a step, and it all happened last year. Well, great. That's a good point, uh, Henry. I'm sure we will have many more discussions with you in the future on other topics because this is a huge ocean <laughs> <laughs> we have addressed one river and in flowing into that ocean uh but uh, we will have definitely i will put the uh, information to your china investment research in the description of the video below and uh we will get back to you on more interesting and exciting uh themes uh in our series uh, of the belt and road institute in sweden's uh, uh webcasts so thank you very much henry for joining us and uh, thank you all for following this uh, first webcast so uh we'll see you soon bye bye thank you very much and best of luck like for now thank you